Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for being interested. And uh, what I hope to do is I'm going to not give you a lecture on South African history. Uh, I suspect that some of you might be interested in that, but that's not really what I'm going to do. I'm going to, in a sense, tell you the story of our struggle in South Africa through my own family story. And I know that some of you have seen a bit of background about the international work that I'm also involved in, and we might touch upon that later on in terms of question time. But I thought I would start with, with my, own, my own family story, because it really is quite interwoven with the South African story, partly because of my grandfather sitting up there. So I thought I would give you a few images along the, along the way. And this is an image which is becoming more and more uh, meaningful to me as I, as I try to come to terms with where do I actually fit into that picture. And I think by the end of our time here, you might understand why that is a big question for me. So where do I fit into this picture? Literally, where do I fit in? Uh, who's that? <laughs> Sitting on. Does it look like me? Got a few more hair there, I think. Um, but uh, that image is becoming for me quite a symbol. A symbol of what it is that I have inherited from my parents and my grandparents. The fact that my grandfather is sitting there with, with a bottle of milk, I do, you, I, you have this expression of, you know, you take in something with your mother's milk. And this idea that there's something that has really become part of who you are, it's like you've received it through your mother's milk. Now in this case, it's my grandfather's milk, um, which sounds a bit strange, but uh, well, it definitely in that context to have, you know, we have a very kind of, you know, macho male kind of culture. I don't know about you in America, but so, you know, men don't show emotion and you're big into, you know, being tough and so on. So my grandfather was, you know, a patriarch, was a political leader. And for him to be sitting there with a baby holding a bottle of, of milk, I think is also interesting about what, who is this person? Now, this is really one of the big questions I'm struggling with. Who is my grandfather? Now, for those of you who do not know much about South African history, if you were to visit South Africa today, and if you were to speak especially to black South Africans, or South Africans of color, and you tell them and you ask them, perhaps not the young people, but the older people, and you ask them, you, you mention the name Verwurt, which is, which is my surname, my family name, many of them would come up with very negative associations. I sometimes speak to, to high schools also in the South African context, and I sometimes ask the young people, when you hear the word verwurt, what comes up? And for most of the young people, even today, they would have very negative associations with that name. And the reason for that is that my grandfather was prime minister during the 1950s and the 1960s in South Africa. And that was a time when things were really difficult for, for, for especially for black South Africans. That was the time when President Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. So he, in many ways, is the person who was responsible for putting Nelson Mandela in prison for 27 years. And lots of other things happened during his time, which, which for many people really, if you think about apartheid, you think of this idea of people being segregated forcibly on the basis of race. The white South Africans this side, black South Africans, South Africans of color, Indian South Africans, Literally, people were forcibly segregated with all the best land, all the best properties, all the best opportunities going to the small minority of white South Africans. That's not the way I grew up, of course. And this is where it's tricky for me in the, in the South African context. How do I, even with young people, give them a sense of how I grew up? Because when I was a young person in the 60s and the 70s in South Africa, he was a hero. He was a hero. The school, some schools were named after him. The building in Parliament was, there was, a, there was a city named after him. There was a big dam. There was, like his name was all over the place. And people who were like coming to me as a young person were saying to me, this is now within the Afrikaans speaking white South African community. They were telling me how proud I should be to be a member of this family. Because they believed that he was a hero and we believed that he was a hero because under his leadership, South Africa became a republic outside the British Commonwealth. And the reason why that was significant was because of a war that took place 60 years earlier between the English-speaking and the Afrikaans-speaking white South Africans. It's 
It's called the Anglo-Boer War, if you've not heard about that. That war left a huge scar on the relationships between white, uh, English-speaking and Afrikaans-speaking white South Africans. And the English-speaking white South Africans was, would, would have been the dominant group at the time within the white community. And under his leadership, the Afrikaans-speaking part of that community managed to, to gain political power. And for them, that was a sense of political freedom. And it was a sense in which the people who've died in those wars, we have now achieved a victory in, the, in their names as well. So that was the language that we grew up with. We did not speak much about discrimination against black South Africans, you know, all the issues around apartheid. When I was a young person, the big conflict was with English-speaking white South Africans. So that's why he was a hero. Now, how did, how did I move from that position to this? Now, that's also me. Still have a few, a little bit more hair. Um, and there I'm standing. It's a picture that was taken with me standing on an ANC election platform. Now, the ANC was the African National Congress, the organization that uh, Nelson Mandela started, and which was the, the liberation movement, really, that brought uh, political freedom to, the, to, to, to all of South Africa. The symbol is the symbol of solidarity in terms of, of, of the struggle against apartheid, changing our system. The flag at the back is the flag of uh, the ANC. So how did I get from a point of sitting on my grandfather's knee, receiving all that milk across the generations, believing really in that kind of sense of we need to be, uh, protect our you know, freedom as white Afrikaans speaking, South Africans, how did I get to the point of actually joining what was seen by my family and by my community as joining the enemy? Because the ANC, the African National Congress, Nelson Mandela, during the 70s and the 80s, they were portrayed as terrorists and as communists. It's painful to say it, but that's, that was the reality during that time. So how did I end up joining what my community and my family described still as the enemy. A long story. I'm not going to go into all the detail. But one of the really important things that had to happen with me was that I had to be exposed to the realities of what was really going on in my country. Now, that's not an easy picture to look at. It's a famous image, really, that's, that, that, that it's about Hector Peterson, one of the first young people, students your age, from Soweto, which is a big, uh, what we call a township outside Johannesburg, which is sort of in the middle of the country. But in 76, 1976, a lot of young people started to mobilize and say, we will change this system. We will not accept being treated like inferior citizens. We will not accept inferior education anymore. And people started to mobilize. And of course, the police and the military started to intervene with very heavy hands. And lots of young people were killed. He was one of the first, Hector Peterson. So if you go to uh, Soweto today, there's a Hector Peterson um, memorial. If you go to the Apartheid Museum, you will see a lot about that. Um, so I had to really be confronted with who was my grandfather, really. Now, this is an image from the Apartheid Museum. I included this because I think Time Magazine is uh, something that you have around here, too, don't you? Basically, what had to happen was that I had to be exposed to people's stories. The image I showed you, the previous one. Um, I had to find out what is the story behind that story. Because when I was growing up, people didn't really, in my community, understand those realities. Um, and I got that opportunity when I was studying overseas. I was at an all-white boys' school when I was your age, Afrikaans speaking, Paul Roos Gymnasium in Stellenbosch, just outside Cape Town. I went to an all-white university, mostly Afrikaans speaking, all-white church, all-white neighborhood. So where would I get an opportunity to really hear the realities, to hear the story of what was going on in South Africa? So I got an opportunity to go and study overseas, in Holland and in England. And when I was in Holland in the mid-80s, I started to meet young people, fellow students from the black community, people of color uh, in South Africa who were also studying overseas. And for the first time, we could actually really talk. 
books, you can argue, you can debate, you can theorize about these things. But when somebody tells you a story which touches your heart, where you can feel it in your stomach, this is what this person is saying is true. You cannot walk away from that. And I was starting to hear what forced removals really was about, what the migrant labor system was really about, what the education system really felt like what the police was doing to people in terms of enforcing the system of racial discrimination. And it started to challenge me. And I remember one of the stories that really touched me was people talking to me about what happened, what, what they did on the day that my grandfather was assassinated. Now, he was assassinated in Parliament. It was quite a strange event. You know, with somebody, a messenger in Parliament, who somehow got into Parliament. There's lots of... Um, uh, Conspiracy theories, how that happened. But the messenger got into Parliament, was handing over the message, took out a knife, and stabbed him to death in his space as Prime Minister in Parliament. And that became a very dramatic uh, funeral within the Afrikaner white community. And when I was young, people were telling me stories of where they were on the day that he was assassinated, and how it was a day of great mourning, a day of great loss. So that's what I grew up with. When I started to listen to the stories of the young black South Africans, I started to hear stories of people saying to me, do you know what we did on the day that your grandfather was assassinated? We ran into the streets and we took off our shirts and we started dancing because for us it was a day of liberation. That's the story that I was faced with. So no longer a day of mourning. It was within my family always. I mean, he was, it was 6th of September today that he was killed, so people still commemorate it um, within the family, within the community. But they do not understand the reality behind that story of why would people run into the streets and be happy, a sense of liberation. So that, that was really the reality that I had to, to come to terms with. And that took many years. I'm not going to give you all the details, but for many years I struggled to try and make sense of how is it possible that somebody who's my grandfather and who I loved as, as part of my family, how is it possible that he was also a leader responsible for so much suffering in the larger, white South, Afri in the larger South African community? And so I grappled with this. And there were times when I wanted to run away from, from who I was as, as a member of that family. It was a time when I wanted to run away from the color of my skin because of everything that that represented in South Africa. Where I wanted to run away from my language, speaking Afrikaans, because it was, it was so contaminated by what we were doing in our country. I wanted to get away from the religion that I grew up in, the, within the Dutch Reformed Church. And the irony is that I was actually helped by black South Africans to accept myself. And one of those people who really helped me to accept the fact that I'm a member of this racial group, I'm a member of this cultural group, I'm a member of this family, I'm a member of this religion. One of the people that really helped was a very, very special human being. I think you know the face on the right. Do you? Okay. So I was very lucky to get an opportunity to meet uh, our president Mandela. He was not yet president, but I find it difficult to just talk about Nelson Mandela. It feels like I need to be more respectful when I speak. So we talk about Madiba. It's a, a sort of an affectionate name that people use uh, in South Africa. So I had the opportunity, and this came after many years of struggling with this, this issue of where, where do I fit into this family and within the wider South African community. And I wanted to say to him that I was really sorry for what happened to him. Because I knew that my grandfather was really the person responsible for putting him in prison. And so I got this opportunity. And I couldn't wait to say to him, you know, just how I, I can't take responsibility for everything my grandfather did. I mean, I didn't put Mandela in prison. But I'm a member of this community. I'm a member of this family. I have to take my share of responsibility for what we did. And I wanted to commit myself to change things. And I, 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 the picture shows me talking, but actually what happened before that was for me the, very, the, the more significant uh, thing. Because when I started to speak, he said to me, just wait a minute, can I ask you a question? And I wasn't quite sure, you know, what's coming next. And I said, of course. And then he said, 
how is your grandmother? Now, she was still alive. She was 95, 96, living far away in a little Afrikaner sort of community. And that was the first question that he asked me. This is the wife of the person who put him in prison for 27 years. 27 years. That's a long, long, long time. With everything else that happened, of course, as well. And that was the question. And then he said, if she wouldn't mind, would you please convey my greetings to her? And there was something in that statement, in that question, that made me feel like even, even my grandmother, even this family, with all the connotations that, that come with it, we are part of his vision of a South Africa that will be a home for all her sons and daughters black and white and colored and Indian. That was the vision that he represented. And that question, that meeting, convinced me that there's a space, there's a place even for somebody like me in that vision of a South Africa where there's a home for all. And so I got a chance to say to him what I wanted to say about the past, about my grandfather. And even then, he didn't want me to speak too much about that. He said, let's talk about the future. Let's talk about what can we do together. And then that's when I, after that, I joined the ANC. And it became a bit public, as you would expect, because of the symbolism. And it was not very popular in my family, as you would expect. My father carries, I carry his name. He's the oldest child of seven children, so he feels responsible for the honor of the family. He's, ex he's intensely loyal to his father, my grandfather. He felt that I was betraying his father, that I was shaming the family, that I was joining the enemy. And he couldn't accept that. And he said, you are no longer welcome in this family. You're not welcome in this house anymore. And there was no way around that. I, we tried to argue, tried to find a way through it, but he would not accept that I can be part of this movement to create a different South Africa and be a member of this Fulbrook family. And my poor mother, she was caught you know, in between, you know, her husband and, and her son. And so for many years, that was part of the reality of, of doing this work, of trying to make peace, trying to reach out to people in other communities, came with the price of tension within, within my own family. And that brings me back to, to the, the image we started with. And that's why I said, where do I fit into this picture? When me, as a 51-year-old South African today, with that history, when I look today at that picture and I, try, and I ask myself, where do I fit into that picture? And I ask myself, who are the people who are not being shown on that picture? That's a very white family. But that's not the South African family. And where is my membership of this broader South African family fitting into this picture? And what is the priority? And if I think beyond South Africa, and I think of the human family to which all of us belong, where do I fit into that family? And what do I, how do I deal with the tensions between my membership of these different families? And that, I think, is what peace work is about and reconciliation about, that we need to find a way to accept that in the beginning, in the first place, we are members of the same family, the human family. That's the foundation on which we, we, we have to live and we need to find a way forward. And then we are members of other families. But if we get the priority wrong, if we prioritize our own biological family or our own ethnic group kind of family, if that becomes our priority, then we have a lot of conflict and a lot of inability to live together in this one village which we call planet Earth. So that's the challenge. That's the vision that I hope that you can relate to. That we start with this image. We all have families. We all come with it. And I'm not rejecting that family. I'm getting actually to know my family better. I'm spending a lot of time trying to understand my own, my own family. But it's not the primary family to which I belong. And I need to find a way to, to live as a member of the human family in the place where I'm, where I'm living, in South Africa, 
And we have a lot of work to do. I don't know if you see this in the media. Um, I know we're not the only country struggling with this, but South Africa, the vision of Mandela, Madiba, President Mandela, of a home for all South Africans, it's, we've got a long way to go, especially when it comes to the haves and the have-nots and the inequalities that we have in South Africa. So thank you for being interested. I really want to make time for you to ask me questions. You might be sitting with, with your own questions. And in the previous um, assembly, you know, the, the middle school young people, they, they couldn't, there was not enough time for questions. So I don't want to say much more. I hope this gives you a bit of a sense of where I'm coming from and why I'm so passionate about this work, not just in South Africa, but in other places as well. And I'd love to hear some of your questions that you sit with. And don't feel you have to, to be polite. If you, if, you, uh, if you really want to ask something, go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, this, this happened when I was a student in England for about three years, and I started to write letters back. Now, this was a time before email, before WhatsApp, before Facebook. I mean, it's difficult to imagine that. So you write your letter by hand. You post it. It takes about a week or two weeks to get to South Africa. And then you wait for about a week or two weeks before you get your letter back. This is a different world, but that's the way it was. And when you phone, you put in your money, and you have a little ticky box, in you, and you keep talking. So it wasn't that easy to communicate, but I was sending these troubled letters back to my, my father especially. And I think what he thought was that I'm basically just being a student, you know, I'm exploring a few things, but, but I will come to my senses, you know, that it, this is kind of a youthful wanting to rebel, wanting to challenge the family, but it's not really serious. So I think he, he sort of responded, he tried to argue, but, but he didn't take me very seriously. And it was only when it got to the point after that meeting with, with Madiba, when it was in the media, and then I actually made it public that I was now a member of the ANC, that it, things really started to, to blow up. That might not be the right language to use. But, but uh, so, so then that really became like final. That was a, a decisive moment. My mother, from the beginning, she was very worried that this would cause a breakdown in the relationship with my father. And all she wanted to do was to keep the family together. And I'm very close to my mom, actually. And it was very difficult because she begged me, please do not join the ANC because it will be the end of your relationship with your father. And there comes a point, you know, then I would stop, I would wait, I, would, I don't want to hurt my own family. But there comes a point when I cannot look myself into the eye, when I look, my, when I look in, a, in a mirror, who is this person? Am I willing to stand up for what I really believe? And if I'm nice with my parents, but I'm sacrificing who I really am, then I'm actually not having an authentic relationship with them anyway. So we had to go through that conflict. And, and it was very difficult you know, for many, many years. But now we're at a point where we are, I feel like we are coming together again as a family. We do not agree about our politics, um, but we do value again being together as a family. And they, they're getting very fragile and old, so I'm very grateful that we do have this time to, to reconnect as a family again. Thanks for the, there's a question at the back. Thank you. The question about siblings, yeah, I've got three brothers. <laughs> now, I didn't say when I was growing up, we had compulsory military conscription in South Africa. So all white men were, had to do two years of military service. This was during the 70s and the 80s, during the time of what was called the Cold War. Those of you who do history, I mean, you would, would have a sense of it. So as part of that Cold War, it was compulsory to go into the army for two years. I had a sports injury in my final year at school. I was a good athlete. I competed with my brother, and he was a bit older, and you know, I used to, you know, like we had to, like, we had this competition. He went into the Parabats, which is like one of the elite units. I wanted to be in that unit, at least, and couldn't go there because of a back injury. And that's why I ended up studying first, because you could postpone your military service if you studied. And while I was studying, my political transformation happened. So I didn't want to go back and serve in the army. But they did. And because of that, we, we, we had some serious conflict. Because they saw the ANC and people like President Mandela also as terrorists and as enemies. And for me to shake hands 
with those people, for them, was also a sense of betrayal. So with two of them, I still have quite strained relationships. One of them, we've managed to work through it, and he's changed his politics as well. So the tension within the family is still there. But a lot of it I would ascribe to what they were, went through also as part of that military experience, how they were indoctrinated and trained to see black South Africans as the enemy, so that you can get to the point of being able to kill somebody. So that legacy of how they've been indoctrinated is still with us. And not just with them, with a lot of other people. Thank you. Thank you. I was two years old when he was assassinated. So that, that means I don't have direct memories. But I do have memories of, of the way people talked about it. And we did sometimes look at little film clips of him as a politician, but also as a family, you know, when we went on holiday, you know, with my parents and so that he would be there. And I've heard many stories of him actually being a very loving grandfather who loved his grandchildren, who would come home from Parliament and would just leave everything and ask my mother, where are the kids? I want to you know, play with the kids. So I'm starting to hear those stories. And for me, they are precious, because it does show a different side to a person who has become a bit of a demon, a bit of a demonized figure in South Africa. And I don't agree with demonization. But I also don't want to be insensitive to what he represents for the larger South Africa. So, so, but as a family person, I'm beginning to hear more and more stories. And I'm actually going to older people and sitting down with them and say, tell me more about who was he really? I mean, he's a name on a wall. He's, a, you know, he's got all these. But who was this person really? Tell me, how, how did he grow up? What, what was he like when he was a young person? Why did he believe in what he believed? And why was he so passionate about this idea of Afrikaner liberation? So as I get older, I'm becoming more and more, I want to understand what, what really is the story without accepting his politics. So thanks for that. Is this a related question to family stuff? And then we come to the, yeah. Are you asking about my children? Yes. yes, I've got two children, and they are already in their 20s. So, um, so they, we often have very interesting you know, conversations about this, because the, there's a next generation in South Africa who basically have grown up after 1994. So they, you know, so they might be your age. And, and imagine if somebody comes to you and say, you know, you have to, uh, you can't get a job because you're white because of the, what, what, what happened in the past. But, and then you would feel, but I didn't do this. Why should I suffer for, for what people did, why my parents or their parents? And that's what young people today are saying. Why should we take responsibility for dealing with the legacy of that system? And so for my children, this is an issue too. If you're a white uh, person today in South Africa, it's not that simple to get a job. You need to do a bit of extra work, and you need to make extra effort, because in the past, you had all the privileges. If you were a white South African, you had a good education, access to jobs, lots of opportunities to own land. That was systematic. The state gave you those privileges. Now we have an equal system, but we still have a lot of inequality because of the past, and that has to be addressed. And young people today struggle to understand this. Why should I stress? And so my children... We've had those conversations, and we've taken them into the townships. We've taken them to places where they can really also hear the stories from when they were young. They got those opportunities that you have in this school, you know, to meet people from other communities and really hear the stories and the backgrounds. So they, I think, understand a bit about the history, and therefore they can understand this is what's needed. But when you ask them, what about their friends? And what about the families where the parents didn't make that effort to expose young people to other communities. Many of their friends are very angry. Many of their friends want to leave South Africa and say there's not a place for us. So for the next generation in South Africa, we have a lot of work to do. And some of the young black South Africans are getting more and more frustrated and more and more impatient because things are changing so slowly. So now you're faced with somebody who is angry from a different community and says, but why are we still struggling and you have all this privilege? And you don't understand where that's coming from. So that makes it very important for us to go deeper into the history and understand. And with our children, 
we've been able to do that. And they still struggle, but by and large, we, we've tried to say to them, don't reject your family, don't reject your grandparents or your great-grandparents, but try and understand what is the story of South Africa. And no, don't only stick within your own little tribe, within your own community. That's been the challenge. And by and large, I feel we've made good progress with, with my children. Uh, they're not perfect, and I'm not perfect as a parent, but there was something around really trying to expose them. And we, we had to make a decision about the school that we were going to send our children to. Now, we speak Afrikaans at home. And for me, my language, my culture, it's important. But the school that they would go to as young people, if it was an Afrikaans school, it would have been basically white. White Afrikaans speaking. Next to that school was an independent private school that had a nice mix of, of South Africans from different racial backgrounds and different religious backgrounds. So as parents, we made the decision to send our children to that school so that from a young age, they would be exposed to young people from different racial and cultural and religious backgrounds. And I'm very glad we did that because that has really made a difference in the long run to their ability to deal with these things. So thanks for that question. That's the question. Thank you. I mean, I don't have an easy answer for you. How do you hold, on the one hand, your, what you call your blood family, which is a, a very important part of our lives, without whom we cannot survive as we grow up as young people. So it's very, very important, our blood family. How do we hold on to that, and at the same time hold on to our membership of the human family? That is a big question. I mean, I, for my whole life, I'm struggling with that question. And I think it's not a question you can give a general answer to. I think it's a question that we, each one of us, in our own places, in our own families, and in our own communities, we need to figure out how to hold on to both. And just be aware of the fact that it's very tempting to give priority to your blood family. But that comes above everything, and that you would, no matter what, you would always prioritize your own family. Now, sometimes that might be okay, but when it comes to, if that makes you blind, or if that becomes like a bond that actually makes it impossible for you to show compassion to people in other communities, especially if your family has had a bad experience, or there's a loyalty in your family around issues, and your experience is different, especially when it comes to that kind of question, how do I have a family with open windows and open doors that allows space for people to which is hospitable to share what we have as a family with those who have less or with those who need so how can i be a compassionate member of my blood family and my compassion reaching across boundaries and across walls and across these divides that we have between us and sometimes the family can hold us back and say no 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 don't do that it's dangerous no no don't don't speak to them because you know they might influence you or you might you know be in risk even so so it's a risky challenging journey that we all have to figure out but i think that it is something about what it means to become a human being so if you think about why are we doing all this and this is the question about the international work as well why are we worried about reconciliation why do we do peace work why do we want all of this i think ultimately the question is what does it mean to be a human being and to be a human being with your whole brain and your full heart is not just to be a member of one family. That's too limited. We are called to be infinite, to be much, much more than just members of one family. And that's an exciting, big challenge. It's, it's tricky, it's risky, but the vision is one of becoming alive fully as a human being. And therefore, you need to work through these conflicts and compassionate, all these things. I hope that makes sense. That, that, for me, is the vision behind a lot of this work. And that's the question about the international work. You know, we, I've, been, I've been privileged to work in Northern Ireland for a number of years. I don't know if you know much about that conflict, where it's not about race. It's about religion and culture and land and minority, majority, Catholic, Protestant, British, Irish. And I've been privileged to work with people who've been involved physically in the war, so ex-combatants, veterans. You saw some of that perhaps in some of the, the video material. And I've been very privileged to work with people in Israel and in Palestine. 
and people who belonging to organizations uh, where, where they've been involved in war and decided, no, we have to find a different way. People who've lost family members. I mean, there's one group called the Parent Circle. It's about 500 members, Israeli and Palestinian. Each one of those families, those members have lost a family member in the conflict. And they've joined forces as an organization to say, we do not want more families to lose children, or husbands, or wives, or sisters, or brothers. And when you see those people coming together, in terms of the human family, it's remarkable. You know, in the midst of a conflict, in the midst of a war, there are people, and you can Google this organization, Parent Circle Family Forum, or Combatants for Peace. Just Google those organizations, and you will be amazed that it's possible for people in the midst of a deep, intractable conflict to actually come together as human beings and say, we want to stop the cycle of blood. This is where the blood family gets tricky, because the blood family sometimes trickle over into a cycle of blood, where what you do to me, I do to you. What you do to my family, I do to your family. What you do to my community, I will do to your community. And you go into the cycle of retaliation, revenge, retribution, cycle of blood. And those people say, we have to break this cycle of blood. And the only way we can do it is to come together as human beings whose blood is the same. I mean, that organization, during the recent uh, wars and so on, you know, they would give blood to each other's communities. Literally, it's one of their projects. And for them, it's an image to say, yes, we, our skin might be different, different language, different religion. We are different. But ultimately, our blood is the same. And we are, I'm willing to give some of my blood to help people in your community who are suffering and dying. Those people I find to be remarkable. So that has really been some of the work, and I'm hoping we can, we can continue to tell those stories, because I think we live in a world where we need to hear those stories. We see a lot of bad news. We hear a lot about you know, the bad side of things. When it, when it bleeds, it leads. You, know, you get it onto the front page if there's violence, if there's blood. But we don't hear about the stories of, of people who are breaking the, those cycles of blood. So that's what I'm hoping to do with my work internationally. One more question. No, the <laughs> let's, let's go with your question. Okay. So the question is around whether I've experienced discrimination because of my family within the anti-apartheid movement. Um, not really. I mean, I, I obviously sometimes people have been cautious, but I think because of the, the family name and because it was so public and people knew about the conflict with my own family, they knew that it wasn't an easy decision, that it wasn't an opportunistic thing that I just wanted to join the bandwagon and be part of, you know, and, and that it's not about a political career because I wasn't interested in a political career. And I think that helped to give some credibility to the choice to become involved. Because obviously people would be skeptical. You know, why, what's going on here? Um, but I think because that conflict with my family was public, it helped me. Um, and, you know, people in the black community have told me that in our culture we respect our ancestors. And in South Africa that is still the case. People respect, in the broader black community, people respect their ancestors. And for me, that has been liberating. So there's not a culture of rejecting somebody because of, of family issues. It's about the politics. And it's, if, you are, if you're not willing to take responsibility, if you are racist, if you are uh, blind to the suffering, then people would be, you know, would be very unhappy with you. And that's what we have in South Africa now, is that some of the white South Africans are saying, we are being discriminated against. And there's an element of truth to that, but I would of often say, but why is this happening? It's because people are getting so frustrated that as a privileged minority, we are not sharing enough of what we have. And people are getting more and more frustrated and impatient. So if we want to have long-term peace, we have to find a way to understand why people are discriminating against us. It's not enough to become now a victim of you know, the new South Africa. So that's the challenge for especially the new generation who doesn't have the strong sense of history that I would have. Um, but thanks for that question. And thanks for the other questions and for your interest.